It's a place where few have gone and most will never see. But that may all be about to change. The unimaginable is being engineered. A commercial ship to shoot people into space. Can the public go to the moon in my lifetime? Can they go to resort hotels on orbit for their vacations? Mass space tourism could be right around the corner, but it's an astronomically expensive and already deadly venture. Is this the beginning or the beginning of the end? When it comes to innovative ideas, one man seems to have no shortage of them. Billionaire Richard Branson. His latest, a plan for the world's first commercial space liner. By his side is the ship's creator, legendary aerospace engineer Bert Rutan. We are aiming a suborbital system to a low enough operating cost that it could eventually reach millions of people. The men have dreamed of space tourism for years. I'd seen the moon landing as a young boy. I assumed that one day I'd be able to go into space and soon realized that governments were not really interested in you or me going into space. So in 1991, I embarked on a mission to try to find a technician or engineer who could build a reusable spaceship. It wasn't until I met Bert Rutan that I finally found the genius, the engineer, that could make it all possible. I originally met Bert through my ballooning expeditions. I was attempting to be the first person to build across the Atlantic in a balloon. And then on any flights that we attempted to try to be the first to fly around the world in a balloon. Bert gave a lot of useful advice in building capsules that could fly at 30, 40,000 feet. We're at one hell of an angle. We're finding great difficulty actually getting the balloon to go down. Branson never made it around the world, so he set his sights on space travel and put Rutan in charge. Yeah. We won't have to put a barrier. Yeah. Okay. So that's the idea. Yeah, that's and I'm perfect. sticking to it. Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> oh, that's great. Bert Rutan is an icon in the aviation world. He rapidly gained fame in the 60s and 70s for his innovative approach to design. For over three decades, he designed, built, and tested new aircraft at the startling rate of more than one a year. In 2004, Bert unveils Spaceship One, his entry for the $10 million Ansari X prize, a contest to spur space tourism. So you're going to come on the uh, horn after he uh, touches down and say, show me the money, right? Come on, 10 seconds, friend. Bert has designed a plane that can fly to the edge of the atmosphere, then drop its cargo. Release. Fire. Pilot Brian Binney shoots out of the atmosphere and into outer space. Roger, shut down. Well, it's really quiet up here. Copy. Down. The spaceship returns safely to Earth. Three, two, one. Bert's team wins the civilian space race. You are the man. And the $10 million prize. If I could please invite onto the stage Bert Rutan, the designer of the first private spaceship, Spaceship One. Bert. 
Cuthbert takes to the stage with his backup, Microsoft co-founder, Paul Allen. I was thinking a little bit about that other space agency, the big guys. I think they're looking at each other now and saying, we're screwed. <laughs> because I'll tell you something, I have, a, I have a hell of a lot bigger goal. And you know what that goal is? I absolutely have to develop a manned space tourism system that's at least a hundred times safer than anything that's ever flown man to space and probably a lot more. I have to do that. Virgin Galactic Airways um, was born a week ago. Three years from now, uh, Bert has promised to deliver five-seater spacecraft to take people into space and hopefully it'll be the start of a lot of people being able to enjoy space. They set up shop in Mojave, California, where Bert's company Scaled is based. Here, he assembles some of the world's youngest and smartest engineers. The cool thing about Scaled that I realized day one is that there's this, you know, this culture of really smart, amazing people. Matt Steinmetz was leading engineer on the prize-winning Spaceship One. Bert puts him in charge of the Virgin Galactic project. Go. Sorry. Two second snapshot of the flight. Across the board, it was a learning experience and a hell of a challenge. I mean, it's just everything is big. It grew in size and everything came along with it. Spaceship One was only designed for a few test flights. This time, Matt's in charge of constructing a spaceship safe for passengers. different game than Scaled has ever dealt with. We've got to carry eight people in there, two pilots, six passengers. So there's just a whole lot of depth to what does that really mean to building a spaceship, you know, that you can fly every day. To succeed, they have to do what only three governments have done before them, put human beings in space. The first hurdle, provide enough thrust to get there. It takes about two and a half times the power if you launch from the ground versus launching from an airplane. They need to launch the rocket ship from a platform above 15,000 meters. And you couldn't go to the rocket store and buy a motor. So they have to design their own. They also need a way for the ship to re-enter the atmosphere without breaking apart or burning up. Being able to do that and still be able to glide and land on an airport, that was the big aerodynamic challenge. Uh, 50 degrees, did I say 50? So I set out to develop something that could be thrown at the atmosphere at any angle. And it would itself straighten out. Well, pretty stable, huh? Nice and stable. That's why we call her feathered re-entry, because like the little badminton shuttlecock, you can throw it backwards, but it straightens out. Uh -oh. hey. Before scale tackles the spaceship, they need to focus on the carrier plane or mothership called White Knight 2. Lead engineer Bob Morgan is overseeing the odd-looking plane's construction. And you've got the spaceship suspended in the middle, and you've got the two cabins here. The team works for a year on electronics, hydraulics, flight controls, and the plane's one wing. How'd that all work out? Where's your phone blocks at? Today, they're installing the wing on its two fuselages. A major milestone for the program. It's 140 feet span, and it's a continuous one-piece one swing from tip to tip. So it pretty much fills this room minus about 10 feet on each end. Did y'all catch that? Yes. OK, here's the assignments. On the left wing, we've got eyeballs, Zach and Steve. You got Zach Reeder. This is basically his wing. It's his baby. He's the guy that built all the pieces and parts. So. 
He's got a lot invested in it. The wing itself is mine. You know, I invested the last year in this one part. Aft, aft, aft. Okay, give me a little more. If it bumps the tops of the rods, we're not going to freak out. I saw them all four go in. Okay. Home. Yes, our home. It's a huge step for the team. In the Mojave Desert, things take a tragic turn. The explosion happened just after 2.30 Thursday afternoon at a remote location at the Mojave Airport. Three scaled employees are killed in a rocket test explosion. It's the company's first fatal accident. We've had no injuries from anyone. And we've done some really dangerous stuff. Bert loves his people. When the accident took place, you know, it hit him, hit him like nothing, nothing I've seen has ever, ever hit anybody. A bunch of guys out in the desert working, you know, just working. It's just a kind of a weird chance thing. And to lose your friends like that, people you see every day, it affected us all a lot. Shortly after the accident, I was very sick for about eight months, and I was, I was out of the picture. Bert, his health deteriorated just, you know, suddenly. It was a lot of chaos, a lot of turmoil. A guy like me, you know, I've been here a long time, seen a lot of things. I thought, it's over. Not only did I lose friends, but I think all the great things that were scaled are done. So, you know, it was really, really, really hard. A year and a half after the tragedy, the team is still pushing forward. And today, they're pushing the mothership, White Knight 2, from the hangar to see if she can fly. It's the big day. It's the worst day and the best day all in one. For project aerodynamicist Jim Teig, this flight will test four years of calculations and design. You get to figure out you know, where you're right, where you're wrong, what assumptions you made were valid, what, which were invalid. The guys who fly the airplane are my friends, and I, I don't want to see anything happen to them. Ever. Um, you know, so it's, a, it's an emotional day. White Knight 2 has never been wind tunnel tested, so the only way to find out if it flies is to take off. Peter Siebold heads up the test pilot program and is prepared to face the dangers of this first flight. The objective is to get airborne as uh, fast as possible and then enough power to prevent overspeed after, after liftoff. Planned test altitude 16,000 feet. If we're out of control below 10,000 feet, uh, we're heading for the door chase. Give us a reminder of what our altitude is if we're having troubles. I'll make the decision to head for the door. Clint, you get to the door, open it up, and uh, I'll probably be pushing you out, so. You've got to always keep that in, in mind. We're doing something that could conceivably kill somebody. And it sounds harsh, but you have to think about it that way. They've designed and modified, calculated and recalculated but it's a radical new design, and there's no guarantee that it'll fly. I believe we've done everything we can to, to test this out, and hopefully it works. Right. Thanks, Steve. All right, Steve, aircraft status. Chocks to go. All right, go ahead and pull the chocks. I'm on the brakes. Oxygen. 100%. I'll be on Commodore 30. All right, Clint, what do you say? I think today's a good day to go fly. Let's go. Chase, uh, Sket 2 1 is uh, rolling, taxiing into position and hold. Chase copies, we'll get in position. Tower Sket 2 1 is taxiing into position and holding for Chase. Bobby 
Tower has got two on holding short at 30. Request a takeoff clearance. Miami Tower, Tower, airborne pickups approved. Winds are calm, runway 30, cleared for takeoff. Okay, guys, have fun. Will do. Number one, throttle. Idle. Number one, start. That's 40. 50. Good cross check. 60. 95. 100. 105. Is that you doing anything with the letters? A little loose directionally? Yep. I was looking out the window and I watching the, the earth go back and forth, you know, at about this rate, thinking, I wish it wouldn't do that. It was a split second decision that the airplane was controllable or whether we really needed to, to bring the airplane back to the ground. We've got some real poor centering of the rudder pedals at zero. Uh, from 2-1 on hot mic. Feels like might have pretty significant rudder lock issues. Oh, I think they're going to get worse with altitude, but if he goes faster, it's going to get more pronounced. TC, make sure they watch their speed, and, and if they keep it slow, otherwise the forces are just going to get worse. We're just uh, working through uh, how to control the rudders here. All right, Clint, we'll need to get your uh, feet on the rudder pedals. Back to scale. And just whatever you do, don't get dynamic with it. Just uh, keep your pedals, just lock them. Perfect. We have what's called a reversible flight control system. It's a fancy word for meaning there's no hydraulic boost. There's no power steering. It's, um, you know, it's as, it's as simple as a, as a go-kart. It's one of the largest planes ever to fly this way. The rudders are directly connected to the pedals under the pilot's feet with push rods, cables and pulleys. Balancing the forces of this giant isn't easy. With this aircraft, you're right on the ragged edge. The problem is that they're just holding the rudders locked. The rudder still floats back there and I can feel it. The plane is unstable in the air, so the team returns to the airfield. Just want to make sure you've got a good landing configuration. We're happy with that. Challenges at the small deflections. Ian definitely feels like it wants to swap ends. And now the next unknown, as they find out how she lands. 100. Seven, three, two inches. So we're rolling along, and Pete says, Okay, got nose wheel shimmy on the left. Nose wheel shimmy, and I look out, and on this other boom, I can see the nose wheel, and it's just sh shaking like crazy, you know, just shimmying, vibrating all over the place. It's still going. No, I'm just going to get it stopped. So I'm sitting there thinking, Oh, wow, I, you know, I wonder when that's going to snap off. The team anxiously waits as White Knight 2 wobbles to a stop. A 2 1 is uh, clear of the runway. Congrats, everybody. There are problems to address, but it's still a huge success. By the time we pulled up in the chocks and got out, Bert came to greet me and, uh, and whispered in my ear, we think it's the gear. What I didn't realize until the flight was that the gear, when it's down, the landing gear, actually 
affects the rudder in a different way. I probably should have seen it before the flight. This is a fabulous airplane. It showed its potential today. It's going to do its job very well. We fought the hurdle of the accident with the rocket motor. We, we got through that. So really the next big one was, are we ever going to fly this gigantic airplane? So really now, you know, the focus kind of changes to rocket motors and spaceships. That's really the next big goal in my mind. It's only 450 people have been into space. The surface has hardly been scratched. I looked at the big picture. I looked at what things could happen. Can the public go to the moon in my lifetime? Can they go to resort hotels on orbit for their vacations? 10, 20 years from now, we could start flying 100,000 people. If commercial space travel can succeed, then anything is possible in space. Rutan and Branson's vision for taking tourists into space is forming here, behind closed hangar doors. All the buildings are numbered, of course, because we're not creative enough to think of real names. So that's uh, 78, we're headed to 63. Okay, let's go aft a little bit. Are we straight on? Yeah. The team hopes that Spaceship Two will be the first production spacecraft of the 21st century. This time, aerodynamicist Jim Tighe is lead engineer. I worked at Boeing for four years, writing reports on wind tunnel data reduction and doing small corrections. And here, I'm um, responsible for spacecraft. So this will be the lower skin, the bottom of that feather flap back over there. Tubes are hollow tubes, which let you control pitch and roll. That's the master caution warning system. Hanging off this trailing edge are the elevants, which is the pieces over there. That's John Kruger in there. That big R2-D2 looking thing shoots a laser beam. So I'd get CLCD, CM, all as a function of alpha, mock, and exactly. feather in my case. <laughs> so that's kind of neat. But, Jim uh, Tide, you know, dreams and streamlines. He sees air flowing when, when he sleeps. I don't know how he does it. It's kind of hard to visualize it all, but uh, it'll make sense once you see all the pieces start to come together. Are we straight on? Yeah, we're pretty good. Bert had a desire to make a bigger vehicle so the passengers could enjoy space and float around. It's fine. Jim's ship will have to fly at four times the speed of sound and withstand forces of up to 6G, which would tear most planes apart. Okay, Klikos. Not too tight. Wait for the shot bags. He's building it with carbon fiber composites, just fabric and glue. You can see it just, it's like a textile, right? It's just fibers running this way, fibers running this way. And along the direction of the fibers is where the material is strongest. Made correctly, carbon composites are lighter than aluminum and stronger than steel. But one mistake could invalidate all of Jim's calculations and cause the spacecraft's feather to fail. This is the upper outer right hand boom skin. This is the last major part right here. Woo, it's hot in there. We gotta have the top of the tail out. More. The new part is ready to be fitted into the spaceship's feather. How are we on height back there? The team is one step closer to turning Rutan's vision into a reality. Houston flight is go. T minus 10, 9, 8. Before Rutan's Spaceship One, the only manned winged vehicles to go into space were the Space Shuttle and the X-15. There were tragic incidences involving both re-entering the atmosphere. I was there at Edwards when Mike Adams was killed in the X-15. He re-entered the atmosphere and crooked. It resulted in X-15 breaking up and him uh, losing his life. Bert's solution is to fold the spaceship in half, feather it, so it can drop back into the atmosphere safely, like a shuttlecock, without the pilots even touching the controls. 
It should slow the ship so quickly that heat buildup won't be a factor. Then the pilots will reconfigure the craft as a glider and land back on Earth. Should we do this? Jim, you ready? Ready to roll? Now the spaceship has to join the mothership in the larger hangar. Over the track. Don't like about it, but just a little momentum is not bad. Okay, now slow it up as we're coming out the door. To keep prying eyes and cameras away, they move her at midnight, wrapped in black plastic, using only torches to guide the way. Do you hear any pops or anything? It sounds good. It's quiet. This is very interesting. There's like a whole herd of people just walking. It's like some pilgrimage or something. Three feet that way. You're left. We're in pretty good shape. I think put the uh, mothership in the hangar. Uh, spaceship's in here. We'll get it off the jacks. Yeah. Button up the doors and go home. I think we're, uh, we're doing good. Tomorrow the big fun starts. We'll made it. So this is symbolic almost in a way moving to 75 because there's no longer groups sitting here, there, and everywhere around the airport. Now it's kind of all starting to come together. You know, fight for, uh, fight for whoever's in charge. So it should be fun. Yeah, and there it is. You have to touch your airplane every once in a while and just, you know. <laughs> she takes care of us. People starting to come out of the woodwork. It's kind of cool to watch people. They just stand back and look at it. Like they're in awe. So four years of your life building up to suddenly this thing becomes an airplane all in one day, which is weird, but it's cool. All right, boys and girls, gather around. So at the end of the day, congratulations to all you guys. This is awesome. This, this is your guys' vehicle. You did it, so kudos to you guys. You can't do this anywhere else in the world. I mean, you just can't do this anywhere else. From now until rollout, um, we just got to pull out all the stops. Thanks, guys. See you at seven. <laughs> See you at seven. <laughs> See you, Danny. Aerodynamics finally takes a back seat to paint and graphics as the team prepares to reveal their creation to the world. After decades of dreaming of space, Richard Branson arrives in Mojave to unveil Spaceship Two. Oh, it's a bit of wind here. Yeah. Hey, welcome back. Yeah, you're looking well, really, extremely friend. well. The partners in the space tourism program are reunited. Oh, you couldn't have walked. You couldn't have walked this far last time. I was within a couple of weeks yeah. of just saying, no, "Hey, no, you know, no. I'm, I'm going to do something here." Yeah. Oh, thank God for that. I ended up having heart surgery uh, maybe right. only three weeks after I was in New York. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So, got it taken care of. The friends take a look at the cockpit of the mothership that will carry both the spaceship and, in the other fuselage, the astronaut trainees. I think that the passengers ought to be trained during a space launch. What you do is you go up and your, your wife is over there, I mean, yeah. halfway to there. Yeah. Uh, hello, have a nice <laughs> flight. <laughs> she drops yeah. off, the rocket yeah. fires, yeah. off they go, yeah. and then when they disappear, yeah. uh, then you do your weightless training okay. and your G's and you land. You can do it all in the same flight. But Bert and Richard are already looking beyond short hops into space to fully-fledged space travel, complete with orbiting hotels. A space hotel can look like almost anything you want it to look like. Knowing Virgin, I suspect it'll be, it'll be the shape of a giant V floating through space. I think the important thing about being in a space hotel is that you have massive windows, so you can actually look out at the universe around you and marvel at it. But if you just have a bubble in several places, 
on a big resort hotel in which you can go in there and pull the curtain and just float around without the noise and the encumbrances. One of the benefits is these almost religious-like opportunities. So we want to dream, and we want to try to make those dreams a reality. I have to tell you that there is a lot of cool things that you get to do when you're governor. But I think that this here today is definitely one of the coolest things that I've ever done. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mojave Air and Spaceport, and welcome to the future of space. You've seen the dignitaries, you've met your heroes. I want to introduce the rock stars of the new space race. With the unveiling comes much celebration, but the world's first space liner still faces many tests. Spaceship Two is scheduled to take to the air tomorrow for the first time. We're at the very end of our day, so we're supposed to fly tomorrow. Okay, you got power on. Tomorrow is really the start of the uh, spaceship test program. We don't do any wind tunnel testing. We build them and go fly them. The planes are wired from nose to tail with sensors that monitor stress and movement. Like a complex nervous system, they'll give the ground team critical real-time information. This is our first chance to see if the predictions we make in a, in a computer analysis are match reality. You gotta have the data going down to the ground station from the airplane in the air, so there's just all this stuff that's all tied together. Okay. Wes Purcell is in charge of the data transfer between the ships and the ground station. When you're trying to meet a, a deadline and you're trying to get something as big of a milestone off as like a first type, first flight in this for the spaceship, you know, it's like uh, a deadline comes up and, and you don't want to be the guy that, that, that says, okay, my, my stuff's not working right. But for Wes, that's exactly what's happening. And we got to be done by five or else we're uh, not flying tomorrow morning. Uh, I did do one slight configuration change today, which I am seriously regretting now. Um, so we, we did deviate from what we tested last night. And uh, I knew it was a risk, and I took it, and it was a good one. So. I think it makes sense to get it as close to a pre-flight configuration as possible to work for everyone. Ready? Anything? It's at zero right now. There's Alpha. Talk to any telemetry engineer, and uh, I think they'll tell you that it's, uh, that sometimes you just, you get problems that you scratch your head over. You're not sure exactly what it is. Tell me within five minutes that it's a miracle. <coughs> I'm impressed, but otherwise I'd say, let's just keep doing it. I, um, I, we don't know what's going on. I'd okay. say, I'd say, uh, let's just pull the plug. Let's wait. I understand that it's not gonna work exactly the way I want it to, but uh, you still want it to work. All that stuff. But yeah, we're gonna knock it off for today. So not flying tomorrow? Not flying tomorrow. Okay. okay. We're close. We'll go have a great day Monday. Don't look so sad, Wes. Let's go. Why not? Sure. We're not flying tomorrow. Five days later, it's all systems go. Spaceship Two lifts off for the first time. We're going to do what's called captive carries, where you pick the spaceship up under the white night, you haul it up to altitude, you test the aerodynamics and the vibration, what we call flutter between the two airplanes. We'll smack the flight controls around to try to excite vibrations and make sure that it quits moving on its own. 1.1, 1.2. What could happen 
we could lose, you know, Spaceship Two, White Knight Two, and three, three, three of our friends, you know. The team puts the mated spaceship and mothership through strenuous testing in the air. The nose come down a little bit, get speed up. Five, six. Yeah, we don't do any wind tunnel testing. This airplane kind of is the wind tunnel test. God's wind tunnel is the, the big blue sky above us. But these tests are preludes to the next trial of the program, the maiden flight of Spaceship Two. The attention shifts to the pilots taking the plunge. I can't even estimate how many times I've thought through all the what ifs. Launching from 45,000 feet, you've got roughly 12 minutes. Two G pull. We've got a significant problem. If you don't have good answers for what you're gonna do in those situations, then, then you get scared. Finally, test day. The team prepares for the first flight of Spaceship Two. All right, good morning, everybody. It's time. We'll finish briefing here uh, by six, step to the aircraft, hoping to start at uh, by 6.20 to make a seven o'clock takeoff. We'll climb to altitude and, and drop when we're ready for it. It'll be the first time that spaceship's flying on its own. It's a little scary. It's you know, my friends are going to be dropped in an airplane that's never flown before for 45,000 feet. Hopefully it flies right the first time, or right enough to get it on the ground safely. Good morning. Richard. Yeah. Oh, good. Nice to see you. Good luck. Thanks. Exciting. Is there any uh, concerns here? They... The only challenge is it's a short flight, so yeah. we've got to figure out how to fly it in a pretty short amount of time. Yeah. But Good luck. <laughs> Thanks the, very uh, much. Cheers. Yeah. We've spent the last five years trying to design and build a flyable spaceship. It's the first glide flight, first no kidding flight on its own. Does it fly right and can we, you know, navigate and maneuver and get back to home? So it's a pretty big deal. Mojave ground, Scat 4 1. Scat 4 1, Mojave ground, line clear, honey. 4 1, flight three, taxi. Loud and clear, taxi, uh, white night two. Taxi, runway 301, variable 4, altimeter 3016. The first time an airplane flies, usually it take off just a little bit, and you get a little bit of daylight underneath the wheels and set it back down. With Spaceship 2, that's not an option because it doesn't have a propulsion system that lets it take off by itself. So the idea is actually to go as high as you can, which seems maybe counterintuitive, but it gives the pilots the maximum time possible to figure out how to fly the airplane, or if things are really bad, get out of the airplane. At Mojave, it's time for the first flight of Spaceship Two. And base confirmed, so uh, green for takeoff. 4-1, uh, base that's firm, green for takeoff. Mojave Tower, 4-1, for takeoff, 3-0. Runway 3-0, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff. I can't. I got tears in my eyes. Oh. <laughs> every time I see this thing, every time yeah. I see yeah. it go, I just wonderful. Brings, it just well up. We're going to go up to a much higher altitude than we would uh, uh, typically fly a first flight. We'll be up uh, near 45,000 feet. Base, how's everybody doing down there? We're looking good. Uh, two one from Skilled Base. Bobby Towers got two one. 
Okay, base is giving us go for release, so I'll arm it at uh, 30 seconds. All right, you can arm it. 40 seconds. Beautiful day to go fly. You betcha. Okay, 30 seconds, here comes the arm. Hello. Okay, 20 seconds, good luck, guys. Will you guys please arm? We're not showing an arm indication. 10 seconds. We are armed. Okay. 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 Copy. Four, three, two, one, release, release, release. Good release. Oh. Okay, it's gone. All good, all good. Beautiful, beautiful. I can't see him. I can see it. Here we go. Shall I oh, I see it. it. I see it. Got it. Roger. Okay, can I pitch doublet? Can I miss a pitch doublet? Has he done it already? Right. Yes, he has. Put turn hard left pitch. Turn sight, starship. Keep the turn coming. I'll follow you around. He's a lot less nervous than we are. Yeah. He's got his butt on the line. God. Oh, man. Good luck, guy. Bert was looking for the Yahoo. It flies like a dream. Best thing I've ever flown. And 326,000. 26,000 feet. He's just waiting, and when you don't hear anything, you're you know worried that maybe it's he's struggling with it. Come on, Pete, tell us how it flies. <laughs> Until some of these maneuvers were flown, you really don't know where some of the demons are lurking and whether or not we truly had a, a nice flying airplane. Slow it up to stall. So on fault 15 Alpha. Okay, 90 knots. Not complete. 90 uh, Freeman speed. What a beautiful flying airplane. Hey, 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 hey! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woohoo! Yeehaw! <laughs> you probably said it's a beautiful flying airplane. <laughs> oh, that's great. It doesn't beautiful use, flying. Doesn't usually use what's God, that's great. It's a good airplane. Beautiful. Hold on. There we go. It's got a good airplane. Hot <laughs> bit. On scale base, we are green for landing. Well, this is one of the three real big risks. Ground gear. Here is that. Looks like all three are locked. Negative nose, going to the emergency. Chase from base, say again, uh, nose gear status. Negative green on the nose. Nose looks good from Chase. Nose looks perfect from Chase. Nice, 20 feet, 10 feet, 6 feet, 3 feet, 2 feet, 1 foot, 1 inch. Beautiful job, Pete. Go. Woo -hoo 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 -hoo. Woo -hoo. I can breathe now. <laughs> A lot of really talented engineers who've you know done the design of the airplane, and the folks who've put the airplane together are extremely gifted people, and, and I, I would trust them with my life. It was good. That's cool. He's just checking things. That's it. Well done. Yeah. yeah. Good job. Thanks, Bert. Super, super yeah. job. Excellent. Fantastic. It, 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 was, it, it was the best flying airplane. It was just amazing. <laughs> oh, that's great. It looks so, it looks so lovely. Why didn't you tell us earlier? <laughs> <laughs> Pete was able to just just kiss the ground with it, you know. Just you know, and when you do that, you've got an, and and you've never flown the airplane before. You've never landed it. Uh, what that tells you is you've got a phenomenally nice flying machine. There's plenty to celebrate today, but the real celebration seems to be galaxies away. Taking a shuttle to the moon may one day become a reality, or it could forever remain a dream lost in space.
Discover the secrets behind the massive impenetrable submarine pens built for lethal U-boats during World War II in brand new Nazi megastructures tomorrow at 9.